Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, welcome to the Monday morning uh, coaching call. So uh, we had our advanced sales training last week, which was fantastic. All the guys came out were awesome. They, they, they uh, really were doing a great job of getting on their side. So our next one, I think, is in September. So make sure you mark your calendars because that uh, everybody left there feeling like they've got a lot out of it. So I appreciate all you guys that did travel out. Uh, that means a lot to me that you're investing your business that way. So I appreciate it. So today we're going to get started with a, uh, an, 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 uh, as always, if you have any questions, concerns, please uh, go ahead and uh, shoot them out here and be happy to talk about them and Missy will kind of watch for them for me. So sure will. Spread out here, okay. Okay, so here we go. Um, you see a picture here, a guy grabbing his chest. The reason you see this is a, um, it was pretty interesting to me when I, f I found this article on what happens when the markets move. So what they found is that when the market moves, uh, people <laughs> visit the hospital. So hospital records show that for every 1.5% drop in equity prices, it increases hospital visits by 0.26%. And that's based on three, record, three decades of uh, daily admin, admin, uh, admission records. And what do you think the major cause was? Well, it's actually not uh, the heart conditions, it's actually mental conditions. But uh, we need to understand this because we get so wound up with rates of return and how much people want to get the rate of return. So who here knows who Daniel Kahneman is? Daniel Kahneman. So we talked about him at the, uh, at the first training that you went to before you came on board. Uh, we talked about Daniel Kahneman. Does anybody remember who he is? I'm not getting any answers. Okay. Well, Daniel Kahneman was the uh, first psychologist to win the Nobel Prize for economics. And he developed the, uh, exactly right, Garner, uh, he, um, he developed behavioral economics. And one of the things he found, you know, what he researched was how do, how do people think about money? And he found out that people think about money <laughs> in a very different way than they think about everything else. People think about money this, in a very different way they think about everything else. So one of the things he found was this, and we, we talk about this at, at training, but see if you remember this. In Western cultures, such as the U.S., when people are retired, older people, if they're given the choice, uh, uh, if, if I was uh, to approach them and say, listen, give me one of your coins so they know it's a fair coin, look at both sides of it, it's a heads on one side, tails on the other side, Say, so here's the deal. You go ahead and flip the coin. So I have no control over it whatsoever. You flip the coin. And when you flip it, if you can call the flip, I'll pay you $100. If, you, if uh, you're wrong and you miss the call, then you pay me $10. So I'll pay them $100 if they're right. And I'll pay, uh, they'll pay me $10 if they're wrong. How many retired folks in the U.S. would take them up on that? That's right, Frank. Loss is way more worrisome. Uh, to seniors than, than gain. So it's not an equal. It's a, uh, so on that particular bet where I, I would pay them $100 if they're right and they pay me $10 if they're wrong, less than 80 or uh, uh, less than 20% um, would take me up on that bet. That means over 80% of them would not take that bet. What's that tell you? That's a 10 to 1. That's a 10 to 1 risk reward, guys. A 10 to 1 risk reward and they wouldn't take you up on it. Most uh, over 80% of seniors would not take you up on it. So what's that tell you about their want, their desire for rates of return? Yeah, they'd like a rate of return. They'd like a rate of return, but what are they really worried about? And Frank, you hit it again. Yeah, uh, loss or preservation wins out over return. Loss uh, is much more worse to them than than their desire for gain. So everybody would like a better rate of return, but they're much more worried about losses. Does that make sense? Safety, exactly. So, we go here. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up here is, recently, is hedge funds trail again. So hedge funds only returned 7.4% in 2013. It's the fifth straight year they've trailed the S&P 500. Hedge funds have lagged behind the S&P 500 uh, by an average of 23%. So, why is that important? See, the last time hedge funds beat the uh, market was in 2008 when they made 31%. So guess what all advisors were asking me? Anybody want to take a wild guess what advisors were asking me in 2008? Take a wild guess. The advisors I would coach, what do you think they were asking me in 2008? 
Where do you think they wanted to put their clients' money in 2008? Because what are these hedge funds, what were they advertising? High rate of returns and low risk. High rate of returns, low risk. Who wouldn't want that? Look at these hedge fund managers. They're awesome. High rate of return, low risk. This is fantastic. That's where all the advisors I'm talking to want to put their clients' monies. Because these hedge funds managers had all these great stories about how you know the, they were using the math and they were using uh, all of these uh, uh, super uh, um, calculations and, and formulas and algorithms and everything else so that they wouldn't lose money when markets go down and they'd make great money when the market goes up. That's right, Peter. Peter says markets are random and not consistently predictable. So here's the thing. These hedge fund managers, I mean, and, and here's the fun, I love this. Uh, this is the uh, 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 front page or the, the um, cover of Bloomberg Business Week. Perception of hedge funds and the myth of hedge funds. So when we look at uh, the last eight years, look at this. So black is the S&P 500 index, and then this, the um, white is the global hedge fund index. So look at the just the straight S&P 500 index has clobbered, has clobbered, except for <laughs> one or two years, I guess it's two years over the last 10 years, has clobbered hedge funds. Now, what do hedge funds charge? They charge 2% flat fee, 2% flat fee plus 20% of your gains. So do you think that the reason I'm, point, I'm pointing this out, guys, is because hedge funds are bad? No, why, anybody guess why I'm pointing this out? Because in 2008, every all these financial man, financial advisors are saying, Mike, you know, I don't even know if I need to be in any fixed. Because these hedge fund managers, they've got down. I just could put all my clients' money in the hedge fund, because you know what? They're going to protect from markets being down. They're going to make a lot of money when the market's up. So, I'm, do you think I'm talking about hedge funds, guys? What am I talking about? I'm talking about any money manager. All a hedge fund manager is is a money manager. So anybody that comes to me and tells me they've got a money manager who figured it out, who's going to protect their clients' monies and downside and going to make a lot of money in the upside, what am I going to tell them? I'm going to say fantastic. As long as you are going to hand over the mortgage of your house to the client if you're wrong, and then all of a sudden what happens to the confidence of the advisor and their money manager? If they have to hand over the, the, the mortgage of their house and put their family out on the street if they're wrong about the money manager, what happens to an advisor's confidence about the money manager? All of a sudden, it dissipates. Drops are gone, I think. It's gone. They're not going to do that. Why? Because they're confident about their money manager as long as they what? They're confident about their money manager as long as what? That's right. If they use the client's money. Then they're very, very uh, confident in it. Okay. So here's the funny thing: these uh, these hedge fund managers, these top eight fu hedge fund managers, were all dragged in front of Congress in uh, in 2007 to talk about why they had made so much money. And here's what's happened to them since. Soros considered one of the uh, these are the eight managers, uh, five of the eight managers that were there. Soros, considered by some of the greatest to be the greatest investor in history, announced in 2011 he was returning his investors' money. So he, could, he just couldn't, uh, all of his formulas quit working. Simons, a former mathematician and code cracker for NSA, bailed out. What a, he, he had an unbelievable, he had an unbelievable uh, a story. And it worked for a couple of years. And then it what? See, all this stuff, it works until what? It works until it doesn't work any longer. After several spectacular years, Paulson saw his hedge funds plummet. Falcone reached an agreement with the SEC because he had borrowed from, quote unquote, borrowed from his fund to pay his taxes after his funds plummeted. So all these guys are out. Now here's the, and, and uh, Griffin is still struggling to hold on. He's one of the few guys that's left in this game, and he's struggling to hold on after tremendous losses. So all these guys, most of them got out of the business because they found out their formulas didn't work. Now, everything happens for a reason, but sometimes that reason is that you're stupid and you make bad decisions. And here's why I bring that up. The SEC just overturned an 80-year-old rule barring hedge funds from advertising to the public. So once again, the police, you know, the people, the, the, the guys who say it's OK for, for, for clients to be 100% in securities, 
So the regulatory agency would say it's okay for, for clients to be 100% in securities where they could lose money, but they can't have 100% of their money in guaranteed. Why, I have no clue, except that, you know what, uh, Wall Street has some awesome, awesome what? Wall Street has some awesome, awesome what? Lobbyists, exactly, Peter. Because why else would it be okay for people to have 100% of their money in stocks and things that lose money, but they can't have 100% of their money in something that's guaranteed? Crazy. Because they're protecting the public, right? Yeah, that's why the SEC just overturned an 80-year-old rule barring hedge funds from advertising to the public. Super. Super. Just like Congress overturned an 80-year-old rule barring banks from doing from uh, being investment banks. And what happened? Within two years of them overturning that, the banks went crazy and caused 2008. So, guys, we, it's our job to take care of and protect our clients because, you know, these regulatory agencies are in the pocket of Wall Street. Anybody ever hear of Fairholme? It was a mutual fund. Still is a mutual fund. So 10 years ending November 2013, average annual return was 11.4%. So what's so great about Fairholme? What's so great about Fairholme? Well, obviously, it beat 99% of all managers over those 10 years. So from, 19, uh, uh, from 2003 to 2013, its average return was 11.4%. Beat 99% of all managers out there. See, the average equity investor only returned 5.5%. So Fairholme had twice the return of the market over those 10 years. That's, that's awesome, isn't it? That's where we should have all of our clients' money, isn't it? Well, what happened the next year? Trailed 100% of all managers. So, guys, things work until they what? don't work. Things work until they don't work. And I'll, I'll say this again, if there's really a money manager out there, it's not that I'm against money managers. We should have our clients' monies in growth types of investments, shouldn't we? We should absolutely have our clients' monies in growth investments. But no more than 50%, more likely less than that since they're more afraid of uh, they're more afraid of risk than they are attracted to return. But what I'm saying is don't get convinced that there's some money manager out there who's got to figure it figured out because as soon as they get it figured out what happens as soon as the money manager figures it out what happens well I agree Peter says passive management and if you look at um, basically any uh, any professor any academic that has looked at the numbers past present and future who has no vested interest whatsoever in selling anything all they do is look at numbers they'll agree with you Peter Passive management is the way to go. Low cost passive manager. So we, we need to go. We need to have our clients' money in in growth, but don't get, don't get bamboozled by some money manager who convinces you he's got it all figured out because they don't have it figured out. They don't have it figured out. We're we're not fortune tellers. There is no magic formula, exactly, Brahma. So you need something in growth, but don't get you need you need an awful lot in guaranteed. Now who tells us how much it should have in guaranteed? Who tells us how much a client should have in guaranteed? Who tells us that, guys? It, not advisors. The client does, right, Casey? In the 21-point checklist, right, Frank? In the 21-point checklist, we have a, uh, uh, a talk we go through with the clients, and they tell us how much they want in guaranteed versus growth. So, uh, Jeff uh, Freeberg, could you get on a second? Because you've been helping guys with the 21-point checklist for for uh, years now. Sure. How many? How many? How often does it come up that clients want to be way heavy in growth? Well, it comes up. They don't want to. It comes up that they are. They are. But when we walk through how much they want to be in growth versus guaranteed, yeah, it's way overweighted. It's a lot higher than what they thought. Yeah, but what do they want to be? They want to be a lot less aggressive. So how often, I mean, you've been doing this with a long time, guys. How often, when the, when the advisor goes through that talk with clients, does the client say that they want to be a lot, a very aggressive? No, they don't say that ever. 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 So, guys, it's the advisor that wants to be aggressive. But can we ever make a client happy by return, guys? 
Can we ever make a client happy by giving them a great rate of return? No, Frank, exactly. We cannot make them happy. If you give them a, a you, not even temporarily. Guys, if you give somebody a 20% rate of return, what do they want to know? Why did they get 24? So here's the thing, guys. Can you make somebody happy by giving them a 20% rate of return instead of a 10%? Twice as happy by giving them a 20% rate of return rather than a 10? No. But can you make them unhappy? Yes, by losing money. So you're never going to make them happy by giving them a higher rate of return, but you're always going to make them unhappy if you lose their money. And that's why we do what we do. Now here's the sad thing about the public, and here's the th sad thing about advisors uh, advising the public. What happened? What happened the year after they got uh, uh, Fairholme got chosen as one of the ten, uh, was the top manager over the last ten years? What happened? People plowed seven billion dollars into Fair Fairholme the year before it crashed. And that's what you know what. Most of these people had advisors. So what was the advisor doing? Just like the, the client. Chasing what? Rainbows. So what about fixed annuities? How, how do they uh, um, stack up? So Journal of Financial Service Professionals, and guys, if, if I would highly recommend you get this, um, become a member of the, the uh, Society of Financial Service Professionals, and you get a journal with them, and this, this is a, a, a top-notch journal. They have a 10-page um, article written by several academics, econ economists, uh, actuaries about fixed index annuities. And here's what they came up with. Well, first of all, a record number of fixed index annuities have been sold over the last two years, over $32 billion worth. So are they a good place for your client's money? Well, it depends who you ask. And it also depends on what kind of uh, 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 analysis people are doing. Are they using real live numbers or are they using simulated numbers? They're using actual numbers, actual market values, and actual FIA returns, like Vanderpelt, Marion, and Babel did. They found that from 1997 to 2010, they looked at 15 FIA carriers, with, uh, uh, so lots more, um, that's carriers, insur 15 insurance companies, so they covered a lot more actual products because most insurance companies have more than one product. They looked at historical returns of both the market and FIAs, and they found that 67% of all fixed index annuities beat the market beat the market. So, you know, for years we were told when we were selling uh, uh, fixed index annuities back in the late 90s, what were we told we could not say, guys? What were we told we could not say in uh, the late 1990s? And what were all the broker dealers telling us about uh, uh, FIAs in the late 90s, early 2000s? What were they telling us? That there was no way the FIA could beat the market. It's always going to underperform the market. And I have no problem saying that. That's great to say that. But what happened in actuality? Two-thirds of the time it did what? It beat the market. Two-thirds of the time it beat the market. Now, I'm not saying you should say that FIs beat the market, but let's quit saying they don't. Do you get this? And how many broker dealers now offer equity index annuities or fixed index annuities? Isn't it amazing this lousy thing became very palatable when what? They could start making money on them. So what Journal of uh, Financial Service Professors is, they used uh, simulated market and FI returns, back testing Monte Carlo, crediting, different crediting methods, options, prices, spreads, interest rates, etc. Because you know what, in the late 90s, interest rates were higher, cap rates are higher, so, uh, and uh, we got clobbered with the market. But what does that show you? It doesn't show you that FI, so what happened over the last uh, 15 years does not show you that FIAs are better than the market. It does not show you that FIAs are better than the market. What does it show you? So if, if, if we were not allowed to say the market, that the FIAs beat the market in the late 90s and early 2000s, and yet two-thirds of the time they did, be, they did beat the market, it did beat uh, 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 with, with no risk, so that doesn't mean that we should be buying or, or saying that FIAs beat the market, but what does that tell you? Let's see, we got in a downturn FIAs, no, that doesn't, that's not what it says, Kevin. I mean, you're right. So Kevin says in a downturn FIAs beat the market, sure. I, I mean, you're right, but that's not what it says. At least in my mind, that's not what I'm looking for. You 
You need to have exposure? No. Guys, here's what it tells us. Does anybody have a crystal ball? Because we were told with 100% in our face, you had better say that, that FIA has never beat the market because it's impossible over time for FIA to beat the market. And yet, what happened? We were told that there was no way in hell that an FIA could ever beat the market. And yet, what happened? They did. So I'm not saying it's going to happen again. What I'm saying is anybody out there who's trying to tell any client that they know what the heck is going to happen next year, five years, or ten years from now is full of what? Beans. We don't know what's going to happen. For a hundred years, do you understand this? For a hundred years, interest rates never went from the Civil War times to uh, 1969. Civil War times to 1969, so there's a hundred years, interest rates never went above 5%. So what were advisors telling their clients? That it was impossible for interest rates to go above 5%. And then what happened? In the 70s, what happened? We, they were, you know, for 100 years, interest rates have never been above 5%, so how can they go above 5%? And then in the 70s, interest rates went up to 20%, four times higher than what they said it would never happen. And then interest rates from the 70s through the 90s, they never went what? Below 5%. So when we told our clients about the... You know, we give our clients with annuities and say, hey, it has a 3% guarantee, but of course, you'll never need to worry about that, right? And then what happened? Because we'll never see interest rates below 3% because they hadn't been there for 30 years. Then what happened? Interest rates what? Went below 30, or went below 3%. So here's the thing. Don't, <laughs> FIAs will never do better than the market. Well, apparently they did. The market, you know, these these money managers. Oh yeah, we're we're never gonna, uh, you know, we, we protect you in the down markets, and then when the things go uh, go up, well, uh, we're gonna get you great returns, guys. Nobody can predict the market, so if we cannot predict what's gonna happen, what do we need to do? If we cannot predict what's gonna happen. What do we need to do? Prepare for the good. So we need to have some money in the market. So prepare for the good and prepare for what? The bad. So that when things go to heck in a handbasket, clients aren't what? Bailing out. They have the guts to stay in because they have some guaranteed money. Does that make sense? So diversify. Exactly, Kevin. Exactly. They need to diversify both, both guaranteed and growth. That's what they need to do. But anybody here telling us that they know what's going to happen in the future is full of baloney. So here's the thing. When journal financial service professionals looked at all the different variables, they validated what we always knew. So this is the chart. So you can see here, P to P is point to point. MA is monthly average. SPX is the S&P 500. And then we have 30-70. We split between 10-year uh, treasuries and uh, gear, uh, oops. Ah! Uh, and then we have 40-60 is 40% um, safe, 60% in the market, 50-50, 60-40. And 70, 30, 70% 70 in the uh, growth, and 30% in safe. So I'm sorry. This is so. This is a growth safe, growth safe, growth safe, growth safe, growth safe. So when they looked at all of the different uh, possibilities, back testing Monte Carlo, all the different variables. Here's what they found out: that um, over time, a point to point would have an average of a 5% rate of return. And then they looked down here and said it would outperform a monthly average 81% of the time. Okay? With a monthly average, I have a 4% rate of return and it would outperform the point to point 19% of the time. Straight S&P 500 index would average a 9.1% rate of return and it would beat the point to point 85% of the time and met monthly average 86% of the time. So you can see here that it, you know, a straight 100% in the market is going to what? To a, to a um, FIA. Duh. It's going to beat it 85% of the time. Not 100% of the time. So we just live through one of those 15% of the times, right, where it doesn't beat the market. But it does beat it most of the time. But when you look at a 30-70 split, that's only going to beat point to point. 13% of the time. 
we go to 50-50, that's only going to beat the point-to-point 58% -point, of the time. Uh, the point-to-point -point is going to beat it 58% of the time, so 60% of the time almost. It's going to beat a 50-50. So, again, when back in the early 2000s, we, were, we had clients moving 100% into equity index annuities saying that it was better than a 50-50 portfolio, and it was. 60-40, even 70-30, look at this, 70-30. Um, the uh, will beat the point to point eighty percent of the time. So twenty percent of the time it'll uh, uh, the point the FI will, will win, and eighty percent of the time the seventy thirty will win. So what does this tell you guys? I mean, this tells you what? Where is a great place to have your guaranteed money? Where is a great place to have your guaranteed money? In a place that you have a a chance to be what? A diversified portfolio with no risk. You have a, a very good chance of beating a diversified portfolio with no risk. So here's here's the point. First of all, does anybody have any questions on on this? Well, can I ask you a question too? How many of your clients would take a five percent rate of return over a six point nine percent rate of return with no risk versus seventy percent risk? How many of your clients would, would take a five percent rate of return over a six point nine percent rate of return with no risk versus a, a seventy percent of their market or their assets in risk? Most would, exactly, Kevin, most would. And then the other thing is sharp ratio. Is a high sharp, for those of you stock geniuses out there, is a high sharp ratio better or a lower sharp ratio, sharp ratio better? I don't see a lot of people, lower is wrong. High sharp ratio is better. So the higher sharp ratio, anything above three, a three percent, uh, a three on a sharp ratio is fantastic. Anything about above a one is good, and anything above a two is very good. So two, two point six sharp uh, ratio versus uh, one point seven. So that's a significantly better uh, risk to reward uh, ratio there with the sharp. So the thing I'd like you to think about is this. If we're look, using fixed index news for the guaranteed, you know what's not in here is what if what kind of return if instead of this 30, 70, 40, 60, 50, 50, 60, 40, uh, 70, 30, and they didn't do this, and obviously I don't have the the computing power to do this, but what if instead of using treasuries, they were using the uh, for the guaranteed, we're using a point to point? What do you think would happen to these rates of returns, guys? Instead of using treasuries, what if they were using point to points for the guaranteed or the monthly average? It'd be higher, exactly. So, the, so now we're pushing what? From five, five or any of these numbers straight up closer to higher. To, um, we're pushing all of these top numbers higher with no additional risk. And that's the banana. You know, that's the banana split. When you take your guaranteed money and you put it into a, uh, uh, a fixed index annuity as you're guaranteed, it's going to push all of your your um, your rates of return higher. It's going to keep your sharp ratio higher, and it's going to beat the pants off of any money manager. Why would it beat the pants off of any money manager over time, guys? Why would a 50-50 beat the pants off a of money manager over time? No doubt. Well, yeah, Andre, Andre, you're right. 50% no loss. Exactly right. Because there's 50% no loss. At least 50% of the portfolio has no loss. So when the market goes down, you don't lose any money. And when the market goes up, that 50% goes up from where? From the lower side. Because remember, with an FIA, it automatically buys low and sells high. An FIA automatically buys low and sells high because it's it gets you out of the market when the market does bad, right? It gets you back into the market when the market starts going back up. So the, the thing I wanted you to understand here is just this. Not that the stock market is bad. I've got half of my money in the stock market. I have always, for the last 15 years, I've had half my money in the stock market and will be 90 years old with half my money in the stock market. But I only have half my money in the stock market. And I have long ago, after looking at every single type of a manager out there, and guys, I read a book a week. I know what's available out there. I know what all the theories are. But all the academics agree that there is no magic bullet. There is no money manager. It's impossible for a money manager to beat the market. Guys, why is it impossible for a money manager to beat the market?
why is it impossible for a money manager to beat the market? Fees, absolutely. Fees is the big one. Because, guys, if you're going to pay higher fees, that means you have to take how much more risk in the market? In order to beat the market, if you're going to charge fees, you're going to have to take more risk. But here's the thing. The, the, the reason that they're going to eventually, that there's no money manager who can beat the market, is if there was a money manager who beat the market, how long would it take for everybody to hop on that wagon? Do you really think that with, with the disclosure that a man manager would have to give now that people couldn't figure out what the hell he was doing or what the hell she was doing? Yes, and how long would it take before every other money manager was jumping on board? And once every other money manager jumped on board, what automatically happens? Return to mean. Parity, exactly, Peter. Everything comes right back down to zero. So it's impossible for anybody to beat the market over time. Now, back in the olden days, they could do that. Back in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you could beat the market. Why? Because if you figured something out, nobody would know that you figured it out. But it's impossible to do that nowadays. So where should you put your money? You should put your, your, your equity money either in, uh, as somebody was saying earlier, into a passive investment like a, a, an indexed portfolio, or find a money manager who you love their story. And, and you can tell that story very well. But don't, just because you love their story and you can tell their story, don't get suckered into their story because ain't nobody figured out a way to beat the market with less risk. It's impossible to beat the market with less risk, guys. It's impossible to beat the market with less risk. And anybody that tells you they are has got a screw loose because many guys have tried it in the past. So unless you found the one manager that is, that is smarter than every other money manager that's ever walked on this face of this earth, you have not found the person who's going to beat the market with less risk because nobody's done it up to this point. If there was a money manager who'd beat the market with, or who was the best money manager to be with, who can beat the market with less risk, how many money managers would there be out there right, right now, guys? How many? How many? There'd only be one, Peter. But every year, what happens? At the end of every year, guess what happens to the number of money managers? There's more and more, Peter. Every year, there's more and more money managers. And then we have what? We have a big crash. And then what happens to the money managers? Half of them go bankrupt. Half of them close. And then what happens? Then they start growing, growing, growing again until we have another big crash. Then half of them disappear. And then they start growing, growing, growing. And then half of them disappear. Another crash. And half of them disappear. So, so are we clear, guys? I, I'm a big believer in growth. But I'm a big believer in growth with what? I'm a big believer in growth with a, well, I agree with a hedge, why? But when we just talk about the growth, with a healthy dose of what? When I'm looking at the safety, absolutely, safety and a hedge, but when I look at growth, I look at it with a healthy dose of skepticism. Because any story I get about growth, guys, I look, I've been looking at things since uh, for the last 15 years, 20 years, on how to beat the market. It does not exist. If it did, we'd all be doing it. And you know what? As soon as we're all doing it, then it will quit beating the, the market. So find a good money manager. Don't go above that 50-50. Make sure that you get at least, if not more, than 50% of their money in guaranteed. And we use, why, and why do we use the point to point, point or the monthly average? Or why do we use an FIA for our guaranteed? Because if we can use an FIA and it performs as well as it does against these portfolios, what a great place to have your guaranteed money. You get to have your cake and eat it too. Does that make sense? So I, I love growth. I have growth. But don't have your clients money more than 50% in growth. And they're going to tell you that during the 21-point checklist. And please, as soon as you get a client who tells you they want more than 50-50, give me a holler. Give Jeff a holler because we'd love to hear that because we just have never heard that before. Because we're talking about people who are no longer working. They don't want lots of money at risk. So have no more than 50-50 in, in growth. Does that make sense to everybody? Super. Any questions, concerns before I cut you guys loose? None. Awesome. Super. Then I appreciate all you guys and have a great week and we'll talk to you all on Friday's uh, GATS call. Thanks everybody. Have a good one.